Okay, welcome back everyone. Welcome to the afternoon sessions of the second day of our Digital Banking Asia 2022 virtual conference. We still have two tracks uh, to cover today. So to kick things off, we have the open banking track with a panel session on maximizing open banking. So in this panel, we have Shashank Kesarwani, Senior Vice President, Technology Leader, Digit Digital Transformation at DBS Bank. We have Abhijit Day, Deputy Vice President at Axis Bank. We also have Mark Willis, Global Head, APIs and Open Banking Ecosystem at Standard Chartered Bank. And our moderator, we have Mr. Toby Smith, Principal Digital at Oliver Wyman. So over to you, Toby. Thank you. Thank you, Jed. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for joining uh, the webinar here today, focusing on kind of everything open banking uh, across Asia. Um, I think we have we have three panelists today who have obviously got in-depth experience and have been working quite intensively uh, across this space now for a good number of years. Um, I think maybe to kick us off, um, why don't I kind of hand over to, to one of you three or all three of you just to explain, I guess, the whole definition of what is open banking? Because I think we've heard over the last kind of four to five years across the region, different maybe connotations of it. Um, we've kind of heard about embedded finance, open finance, banking as a service, but open banking kind of has its, its core definition uh, kind of somewhere in between all of that. So maybe, uh, Shashank, if I, if I kind of come to you first and, and hear what you feel is what, what open banking truly is. Sure. So I would say uh, like this, there has been a remarkable shift in uh, development approach across banking industry, wherein they are focusing more on building products uh, using APIs and then mapping them to the business requirements internally. So when we do this digital platform implementation using API and open APIs, that gives an opportunity to come up with a business model to partner with other fintechs wherein the fintech maybe can have their own ui dashboard and they connect to the banking open apis which are more reliable given the expertise the banking techs would have and also can leverage on the low cost uh, benefit they can get out of the integration so it's a win or two win situation for both wherein the banking can make a additional source of revenue and the fintechs also get the benefit of not looking into hiring all those expertise around financial modeling and uh, technologies to do the exchange connectivity uh, nitty gritties so they can focus on their business at their end to get the more consumers on their platform and get more reliable data from the banks brilliant okay awesome thank you and, and, and i guess bringing it kind of more live or tangible context it, it, could you give some examples uh, of what we see in the market today um what would be classified as open banking Sure. So suppose, let's say, a man, uh, if uh, a bank is building out a trading platform, say for equities, buy and sell, a very simple example, wherein basically, they, ideally, uh, they would have their own mobile app uh, uh, and they would have their web interface, which would be having a dashboard and they connect to their own internal APIs to facilitate the customers to log in and basically place equity orders to do the trading for various markets. Now, uh, a fintech which we, who wants to uh, also roll out a similar kind of online trading equities uh, platform to the customers doesn't need to start from scratch to have all those developers for backend and uh, do the uh, market data sourcing, uh, licensing costs and all. Instead, what they can do is they can talk to the banks, uh, RMs and real salespeople to explore the open APIs. So basically, what they would get the benefit is that they would get the backend, uh, uh, backend complexity resolved by the banking system. And on their side, they just need to build up a UI based on the state of the art UX and, uh, and uh, integrate with the open APIs with the limited resources. And then they get the, uh, and they can, they can basically have an early start to roll out the functionalities to the end user. So the banks, since they have to source in the market data anyways for their own internal apps, and they have got such a huge volume for the clients, so they can, they can negotiate better from the exchanges to source in the market data. And this benefit, they can pass it on to the 
and consumer at the fintechs and as well so it works both hand and uh, there's more reliability and trust and it's more easy to integrate awesome okay and uh, mark if, if i come to you next uh, around if i was to kind of take that definition and, and kind of compare it to other terms such as embedded finance and, and banking as a service um obviously similar technology being used here but what what's the, the kind of the, the the stark difference here that when we, we talk about kind of propositions. Yeah, thanks, Toby. And um, uh, you know, thanks to all our listeners for dialing in today. Um, look, I think I think open banking is a very foundational concept, right? And if we rewind a couple of years and we look back um, at what banking was, say, a decade or more ago, um, the, the, the banks had the luxury of owning their full value chain, right? So they own the customer platform, the customer relationship, you know, which we refer to as the channel, um, the product, as well as the distribution, right? So, you know, for many, many years, it, it, it went on like that. Um, I think, you know, with the advent of mobile apps, we started to see some disruption in the financial services space. Um, and then we moved into the open banking era, right? And, and fundamentally, what does open banking mean? It means, you know, how that value chain has been split up, right? So there are new players now that are able to build customer platforms and own that customer relationship um, with banks, you know, operating a little further down that value chain and providing those core services that they're really good at um, in terms of the products, you know, the licenses um, and those relationships they need to, to facilitate things like payments, right? So... You know, that's the way I look at it personally. I say, look, it's a very foundational concept. Of course, APIs as a technology has been something that's accelerated that whole um, decoupling of the value chain, right? So it's allowed us to, you know, facilitate these interactions between enterprises and counterparties in, in a standard way, right? So as a technology, it's been a real, it's been a real driver um, of open banking. So... You know, coming to some of these other terms that we see um, being used, embedded finance, banking as a service, um, you can think of them as, you know, higher level business models, right, that are really built on top of the foundations of embedded, of, of open banking, right? So embedded finance is specific propositions where you're taking to the bank to the point or the customer touch point, right? And banking as a service, you know, is, is a slightly different uh, model of that. But if you think about it at a core level, it really is all open banking and it is facilitated through, you know, API architecture and API connectivity. Great. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you both. Um, I guess taking taking that notion of, of kind of the, the value chain um, concept, I, I think uh, there's been a number of different studies now done that, that kind of show the the exponential growth that we're seeing across open banking and and actually i think asia has been touted as if not the one look close to being the largest but the second largest kind of uh, market that is seeing the most adoption seeing the most growth and seeing the most value sought so in terms of what you you guys are seeing obviously in, in the, across the region we're seeing different markets different regulators opt in for different approaches here such as the, the kind of the mandated model you see in Australia, but also then the kind of hybrid models we're seeing in in uh, Hong Kong and, and Singapore. I think, Abhijit, are you? Do you think we we're doing enough from a, a kind of, I guess, a regulatory standpoint, um, and also kind of from a market dri driving standpoint as well? Are, are we kind of are the big banks kind of preventing us, or are they are they actually enabling uh, open banking to take a, a, a bigger hold in financial services? Yeah, thanks, Toby, and thanks everyone in this panel. See, uh, to answer this, I'll take two steps back, right? And I'll uh, take everyone uh, back to those days when we used to go to our home branch to do our banking, right? So let's say I, I need to clear one of my chain. I need to visit one of my uh, uh, home branch where my account has got opened. Then the transformation came. We saw all those core banking and all with the core banking solution across, I mean, especially in India, right? Where the demography is very large, right? That geography uh, range is very uh, large here right so here uh, one bank those days were having at least uh, 2000 or 3000 branches right so core banking came in any of the branch you go you will get your banking then one level of uh, transformation gone up where we saw all those mobile banking internet banking and now with this upi and psd to like in europe we can do uh, 
transactions or we can share our data in any open network right now all with all this transformation we have seen uh, regulatory change regulatory new regulatory mandates right and especially for the large banks we are the custodian of all these uh, regulations right when central bank uh, they they uh, circulate these new regulations on data sharing or on api uh, externalizations and policies right large banks have uh, lots of responsibilities to adhere those uh, mandates right and when we open up our capabilities when we open up our apis right shashank was talking about uh, open apis and all right in in in, the, in terms of open apis it's always a pain that to identify which all type of data will share and which are not right so this type of regulations or this type of mandates from the central banks right this actually helps and guides us to take the right call and it's a co-building experience right so any fintech there if any fintech is coming and asking for a few of the data or asking for a few of the new apis right we the large banks or any any other banks right who are the custodian of all these central banks policies and rules right we follow the rules and we guide them to create the framework right so i think today how the large banks are operating especially in india right we are in a right track we are following all the mandates and regulations right and that inter ecosystem which are co building with our fintech partners or any other partners right any there are lots of startups coming in uh, in india uh, it's a co building experience right and it's a co ecosystem we are building on top on on the basis of those regulate uh, regulations and mandates so that's my view on it thank you thank you okay that's that's really interesting and if i come to mark shashank both you, you both of you obviously in, in singapore i what is the api adoption like is that is it something that you guys are seeing obviously from a an enablement perspective from the digital banks or the the, the digital the, the virtual bank licensees that are now coming to market with those modular tech stacks and then obviously the adoption in the bigger banks is that are you seeing uh, i guess more more growth there or, or is it still kind of baby steps yeah okay so so i mean if you look at it from our perspective um the big growth has really been where i sit and that's in the corporate and institutional space okay and that is where um i guess two two primary models are driving this growth you know one is our corporate clients um themselves are developing new economy um capabilities right so they're going through their own digital transformations um they launching apps um or they brand new sort of digital native clients and they need these banking services um as part of that experience right so you know in the retail space people always quote something like you know booking a a ride on on grab or a ride hailing app right you don't really know um that banking is happening in the background you're just fulfilling the task of uh, booking a ride right so at the end of the day you know that's a corporate and the corporate does need banking services um to provide those experiences to their customers right so that's that's the notion of b2b to c right um e-commerce is a big driver of that so if you think of you know travel um booking sites right if you can get it priced in whatever currency you want right and you can pay in whatever currency you want now some bank is providing the fx quotes and facilitating that right because ultimately that that e-commerce a company is collecting it probably in their base currency right so there's a lot of the stuff um happening in the background that you don't see um and this and the second part i would say is if you look traditionally now or if you look at the corporates now they're very much moving towards platforms um that are specialized right so treasury management systems um that are really good at 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 what they do um or they're expecting this capability to be a part of their ERP right so when they pay an invoice right or when they pay a collection of invoices you know gone are the days where a file gets exported and then it gets transformed and then uploaded through the bank's portal and then processed um so that whole process is now tightly integrated right it's embedded within the client's ERP right so for us i mean those are probably you know the two two avenues where we see a lot of growth um and adoption and opportunity Shank, anything anything to add there 
yeah i mean uh, uh, like rightly pointed out by mark so uh, banks are i would say even exploring uh, things outside banking or finance in that sense that now one of the banks i know have come up with a marketplace for selling the cars and the 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 opportunity comes from the trust trust they have built across their user base over the years and they know the 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 funding they can get seamless so basically it can be one shop for all their needs where they can you know get the uh, uh, car loans and uh, choose what car would be the best and they can get it delivered for them so this goes hand in hand uh, with that that okay what when the, once they have come up with the open apis for this marketplace this opens up the avenues for other fintechs to also integrate and send their own, own customized solutions in their regions so these are uh, the decent examples and the evolution that has happened over uh, in the open banking space you, you you mentioned trust there uh, obviously i think when when you when you think about the the real life use cases of of what what we're doing across the the kind of what what data we're sharing uh, and what data we're passing on um how how in in the region are, are you guys in terms of when you're building your propositions around this um kind of solving for that that trust element like giving giving your customers the, the the comfort that they are what they are sharing what they are transferring is is being controlled quite tightly is that is it coupled with kind of cloud maturity and an understanding as, as financial institutions how you're kind of operating on the cloud now or is it something slightly separate okay so the underlying concept i would say is like uh, once you have built uh, transactional platforms of uh, you know uh, which are in global in nature using the cloud cloud technologies and already have experience of building them over the years and rolling out those features to the uh, customers then it is more of a matter of products and entities which we want to enable on these kind of similar digital platforms now the the experience that have been garnered uh, via going through various regulations endorsement and also in house uh, mandates that we have for security like encryption uh, what we want to uh, what kind of api gateway should be there and all the kinds of validation so these learnings have contributed to build up new systems where you have a checklist of things in terms of security and in terms of cloud technologies what are the it should be a private cloud on premise and even if you go to the aws it should be demarcated in terms of namespace so all these learnings have contributed well to build out new uh, open banking platforms wherein other fintechs can leverage on without second thought of uh, you know uh, of data privacy uh, data issues uh, or maybe data leaks uh, so this this has enabled uh, the whole industry to open up uh, with the mutual trust they have with the banks Okay, interesting. And Mark, Mark I'm going to come back to you uh, again because I, obviously I think your your space being in in the, the CIB type uh, roles. I, I think obviously coming out of a global pandemic, um, there's been a, a big push for for obviously being able to conduct your banking services and actually even those beyond banking services um, digitally or remotely because uh, we've been in lockdowns. Um, have you seen an acceleration over the last three years here? And, and if so, it would be quite interesting to hear what, what some of these use cases have been for your for corporate clients. Because uh, quite often, I don't know, when you when you associate in, in kind of market around open banking, it's quite often, what does it do, the kind of retail consumer? But I think actually massive amounts of value can come from open banking when you are talking about corporate and institutional banking and the clients that you serve. Yeah, so... so... I mean, let me clarify something first. So when, when, you know, at the end of the day, it still touches the end customer. It's just through an intermediary, right, which is the corporate customer. And that's the notion of the B2B to C. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think when the pandemic hit, we, we had a couple of examples where, um, and without going into too much specifics, where, you know, we had a very slow ramp up plan with a particular client for an app they had been building. Um, and this app, had a concept of a, a wallet that you could do do things with, right? So you needed a way to obviously collect money into the wallet, you know, top it up with with fiat currency, and then pay it out when you want to turn it back into um, you know normal money. Um, now those kind of transactions they actually facilitated through a branch network, and I think they had 
something like 120 branches um, in, a, in a particular location. And of course, you know, when the when the pandemic hit, um, we kind of just found found out about it through a news article, right? That they had decided to uh, shut shut their branches and everything was going on to the the app, right? So, um, you know, the volume sort of went 100x overnight. And and I think you know just building on um, a little bit of what Shashank said, you know, from a technology perspective, I think when you're dealing in the space, um, there is a huge expectation of 24 by 7, right? It's no longer good enough to say, hey, well, we'll, we'll give you this channel, but, you know, on a Sunday, we're going to take it down because we need to do maintenance. Um, you know, that kind of operating schedule doesn't exist because it is connected to an end customer. It's connected to our end customer's customer, right? So, um yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's one example. Um, we saw a lot of growth um, in those specific use cases as people moved uh, more digitally, right? particularly around instant payments, instant collections, right? Paying for goods and services. So any company or fintech in intermediary that's facilitating that sort of flow um, had a ma massive uptick, right? And and of course we saw a lot of that in Asia, right? In markets like India, um, Hong Kong. Um, you know, these sort of places, we, we, we saw a huge amount of growth. Yeah, okay. No, and, and that's, that actually brings me on to my next my next point, uh, Abhijit. I, I guess it, India was, was uh, I think, when you look at the statistics behind it, that the growth was massive, right? Especially coming uh, into the pandemic or coming out of the pandemic, but also within it. Um, in terms of kind of focus areas and, and kind of opportunity space now that you're you're planning ahead into 2023, are there any specific use cases that you guys are focusing on um, to try and get get live in, in your customers' hands? Yeah, so I, I'll just share a couple of uh, you know, trend which you have seen in the industry, right, in our, in our part of the country. Right? So one is that the financial inclusion, right? So we, uh, again, I mean, uh, being guided by the central bank and all, what we are creating a open data platform where all the financial institutions, all the data institutions, right, who are holding data of the customers in a very secure and consensual way, they will share the data and there will be a kind of account aggregator model, right, through which uh, banks or the other BFSIs, right, institutions, they can underwrite the customer, they can create a better offer. Uh, they can offer them a better insurance policies and all, right? So these are financial inclusions. Example, I mean, if we uh, take the, uh, on the context of Singapore, right? Because uh, what I've seen that most people are here from Singapore, right? Just imagine a hot dog seller, he's selling hot dog in Marina Bay, right? And in the morning, he uh, got a, a loan of uh, $50, right? In the evening, he uh, repaid uh in 70 dollar 20 dollar is giving more but he has made a business of 100 dollars right so this type of financial inclusions basis the data which we have got and in india banks are having huge chunk of data right and here mostly private banks right they are in the business for last 25 30 years just imagine the number of data or amount of data which we're having and there are lots of data democratization happening here we are remodeling our data because you know Sadly, there are a chunk of data which is not having a good quality, right? So that quality check and all we are doing, right? We are purifying the data. And then this data will be shared in a consensual way in an open network, right? Uh, we call it OCEN, o -C -E -N, right? It's been uh, guided by the central bank. So with this type of uh, approach, what I can see that the trend is that financial inclusion, also uh, not only the customer acquisition, that enter customer onboarding journey and the retaining services, right? For example, uh, we in our access bank, right? We have an API developer portal. And it's not a very new thing. I mean, almost all the banks are having developer portal for the last three, four years. But what we have seen, people are coming and querying about APIs. They want to close the commercials. They want to you know, negotiate the rates and all in the portal itself. Even post onboarding, they need to see the API performances, their business performances. So they want to have a, a complete solution, right? So once you onboard the customer, you cannot drop it, uh, drop him in a in, in certain point, right? There, will, there should be end-to-end -end solution. So these are the trend right now. And uh, other banks are also coming up with this type of solution. 
right so we have launched this api developer portal which is industry first where any corporate they can onboard themselves in this portal without having any you know uh, manual intervention they can close the commercials they can uh, tick the terms and conditions all the legal agreement can be vetted in the portal digitally and they can consume the api from the developer portal itself and the dashboard and all those you know chatbot enabled services right so these are the trends which we have seen right now right and that's how this entire uh, business model is you know revamping and this is all happening after pandemic thank you thank you okay and then you you, you touched on a good point i think it's a lot is changing and i think that that's quite quite obvious but from from your perspectives uh, and maybe Shashank, i'll come to you here but how, how are you changing how you you have to engage with these third party vendors now um is it is it open portals where you're kind of giving that kind of blanket access but then when you're actually commercially getting involved with them is that are you having to to work slightly differently to to kind of hit the speed that you need to hit at um, versus your your long-winded or potentially long-winded um, procurement processes that maybe of old you would have had to go through Okay, so we do have a centralized procurement team, which is responsible for onboarding the clients and any partners that we would have. So there would be a certain checklist about all the in integrity of the uh, partners or the end clients that would be a due diligence would be performed and then only they would be, you know, onboarded. So, so this kind of uh, 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 financial inclusion from the regulatory perspective also helps the to build up trust across the end customers that okay if if say dbs or standard charter have onboarded a particular uh, partner they would have already done all the due diligence and uh, we uh, they, uh, in a way they are audited from the monetary authorities and they are regulated and that's how it brings the bilateral trust and uh, it facilitates for more uh, end customer usage and you know getting more users uh, on the fintech side yeah okay thank you and i guess it's kind of touching on sorry you... i'm seeing the same thing happen in case of retail customer when you see that uh, this customer is being underwritten for a particular loan or a particular you know financial offer by some bank called a that will give you a confidence right and there comes an open data network through that network will come to know consensually that this customer is a very legitimate customer right so in case of corporate also this type of checklist we also follow i mean it's a common standard across the globe i guess right okay no oh, good good and then i think what we're kind of touching on the 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 title of this track maximizing open banking um mark wh wh where do you think kind of we currently are uh, as a region but maybe specifically as, as a market as, as well um and uh, kind of at that position what what needs what more needs to be done to encourage kind of more wider adoption yeah look i, th I think um i mean from from what i see asia is definitely blazing the trail right in terms of adoption um fundamental changes in the clearing systems for example upi in india have facilitated this rapid growth right and ability for new players to enter the market um so 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 definitely from a regional perspective it's been the early adopter space um it's where we've landed a lot of our sort of early volume and and drive as we've expanded across the globe um, and I think you know other parts of the world definitely look towards us you know for those examples um, and that thought leadership so you know are we doing enough I think um, you know from what I can see it's it's definitely a highly competitive space right for the banks at least because um, you know you look at the deals that or, or the requests that come from clients or the RFPs API is normally always a part of that solution, right? As the client is also trying to drive efficiencies, consolidate, you know, the number of platforms that they use. Um, these are all factors to create that, that seamless integration, right? Um, so there's definitely demand. I think um, all the banks that are, are playing in the space recognize that. Um, and they also recognize the threats, right? They recognize the threats of being, having an adverse selection in the value chain, right? Because we don't want to just shift further and further down and just provide 
data and plumbing, right? So, um, you know, for us, you know, where do we see the growth and opportunities? Obviously, the ones I mentioned, right? We will continue to focus heavily on those B2B to C type growth models, um, as well as the third party platforms, right? What are our clients using? Um, and how do we make sure we're present in those platforms so that we pre integrated? Obviously, we get the scale from that because we integrate to the platform once on the back of, let's say, one customer opportunity, but there could be five other customers of ours in there and then potentially other prospects, right? So having your services pre-integrated into an ERP platform, you know, or, or a treasury management system, um, those are the kind of partnerships that, that we're after um, and we'll continue to do so. Um, the, the other area I would mention, and this is kind of how do you build services that are a little bit higher up in the value chain, right? So if you look at a lot of what the banks offer today, it's, you know, give me an account balance, you can initiate a payment, um, facilitate an FX transaction, and so on and so forth, right? It's very sort of bank product centric, okay? Um, and there's a bunch of fintech enablers that have injected themselves between the banks, you know, and these marketplaces, right? Now they've done that because they understand the user journey of what's really happening between the buyer and the seller or the merchant right, in the space. So, you know, we're looking at things where how can we lift up? Um, how can we provide higher value services, right? And, and we've launched a capability just, just recently, we call it payouts as a service, right? So it's not just simple payments, it's, all the rules and all the parties that you want to pay, right? And it's fully composable. So, you know, you can decide, well, this is how I want to split the payment and I, these are the conditions and some of the money is tied up in escrow, right? So that's actually what the customer is looking for because they're going to have to build that anyway, right? They're going to have to build it on their side. So we're trying to build these higher value services. Um, we've got a, you know, a decent roadmap in terms of how we're going to expand that capability. Um, the, the, as I mentioned, this power to service is, is a pretty unique offering um, and we'll continue to you know, expand on being a lot more customer centric and how we embed our capabilities into those journeys, right? Okay. And, and do, you, do you feel that it, it's, you can do this alone or do you, do you need, does the cooperation across the, the different banks in, in your specific market, for example, of where you're offering these products would help in, in kind of this, this more wider adoption? Yeah, so I think to answer the question simply, no, you can't do this alone. Um, the partnerships are essential, right? To, to, and you don't want to be in the business of building infrastructure. For example, um, let's say there's a player that has all the ability to adapt into you know, 15 or 20 or 25 different ERP systems. Um, and they're able also to connect to 10 or 15 banks, right? Now, that's not really a play a bank wants to go after, go, go after, right? But there are players that can do that. Now, we will partner with those players um, to get us quicker time to value and quicker time to market. And we know that a lot of these corporates are multi-banked anyway, right? They're with HSBC, they're with DBS, they're with Stanchart, they're with City, right? Because they're banking across a large footprint. So, um, you know, it, it is that co-op petition space. Um, you know, I think where where the banks can collaborate, particularly in their space, is what we see in data sharing, right? So you're starting to see HKMA is pushing some of these frameworks around data sharing. Um, obviously, if there's something in it for the customer, right? Because the customer is the one who has to consent that that data share, right? But um, and I think Abhijit was was alluding to this, right? But it's you know. How we facilitate the data sharing, I think, is the next next level. Okay, thanks, thanks. And uh, Abhiji, in terms of, of kind of your your viewpoint from a slightly different market, do you share similar views, or is it is it kind of, I guess, the different players in, in India, such as um, UPI, that the like what they've done across their payments landscape is, is transformed things. Um, any any different views there? No, no. I mean, see, uh, if you see the open banking, right? <clears throat> Globally, the concept is same, and whatever we do in banking basically for three things right customer acquisition or onboarding give a better service and customer retention right i mean i, I don't think we do anything uh, any other uh, anything in bank in bfsi for other than these objectives right so going back to that open banking part right that collaboration what mark is saying that it's not i mean in this world right when uh, 
any customer can do a transaction from any of the payment app in a second, especially in India, right? After this UPI thing. I mean, once you're not, you're not being able to give a better experience, right? You are up. I mean, she will never come back to you, right? Here, the competition is very high. Also, if someone is looking for a personal loan or any you know, car loan, right? And if he's not getting the approval or whatever the decisions are, right? In seconds or probably in minutes, you're gone. So there should be a co-building experience. We cannot restrict our customers to do banking only on our platform, right? There should be banking as a service, what Mark was talking about, right? Or banking as a platform, right? Also, if you see in India, the trends are that uh, banks are coming up as a price comparison tool where they can compare the uh, different e-com products, right? And then they can uh, buy the thing from the bank's platform. Right? At the same time, uh, Shashank was talking about that uh, one of the bank in Singapore region, probably they have come up with a uh, car loan marketplace, right? So it's again a trend here also, right? So it's a, uh, no, there's a diversification in the business and it's not only for the banking or finance for banks right and their open banking will give that entire platform or enter uh, you know facility where we can leverage on right and it's a collaboration right it's a complete collaboration through which we'll uh, get that height got it it's just yeah you're nodding your head there so i guess you aligned with that yeah uh, of course i uh, completely agree with that i mean open banking is all about collaborations and one of the examples that I can cite is like uh, India has done a great job of uh, having the UPI and the payments so seamless within the India between the people. Uh, now, now the next step forward that I see is that like suppose I'm in Singapore and I want to send to somebody in India. Now we are looking at an integration or a collaboration with the UPI between Singapore and India. And what that opens up, I can directly send money to a person just by his phone number. I don't need to go to net banking and, you know, uh, add his bank account details. And then I do the TBS process of transferring. So uh, uh, so that's the synergy we achieve, you know, the, like the like Abhijit mentioned, right? Once the, uh, the person, uh, the end user has gained that seamless experience, then there is no going back. So everybody will start doing all these payments and it will be a huge win for cross-border border payments across the banks, which are all regulated by their each individual regions. And we see the volume growth and uh, you know uh, the platform stabilization, everything. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, just time, uh, conscious we have 50 minutes left. If anyone in the audience does have any questions for our panelists, please post them through and I, I'm happy to, to ask them on your behalf. Um, I suppose, one, one one other question I, I tend to have, and especially coming from well, seeing where you guys are positioned, what, what are the biggest challenges you're currently facing within your own respective businesses to, to kind of push the notion of, of open banking and getting it into the mind, the, the business side of, of the banks? Um, Mark, I'll come to you first here. Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I would say the thing top of my mind at the moment um, is really monetization. Right. Um, how do you price for these services? Right. So, you know, these these use cases that Abhijit and Shashank have um, referred to around instant payments. Um, what's really the role of the bank in that flow? Right. Um, and how do we make money at the end of the day? Right. We're all um, commercial institutions and uh, they're for profit. Right. So, um, you know, it's great to get in and get the adoption and show that the platform works and I feel that that's where a lot of the banks have got to right we've proven that hey this is something um, you can drive volume through it um, it is growing right it is you can't ignore it but how do we derive value from it right so let's look at every single deal and understand you know what are those benefits for the bank because we've spoken a lot about the client benefits um, so far in this panel you know yeah, it makes it easier for me. I could just send money from Singapore to India seamlessly. There's no SWIFT, there's no TT charges, um, et cetera. But what, what, it, what is in for the bank, right? So the bank benefits. So, you know, I would say it's, it's a challenge, right? And, and um, India is one of those markets where, where it's a challenge, right? Where a lot of these are, re are regulatory mandated, right? That you cannot charge fees on some of these services, right? So even if you're providing the connectivity, 
you're serving um, customers that could potentially be very high volume and require you to put money into the operations to serve them. Um, how do you monetize that? Or are there other indirect um, benefits, right? Are they doing, um, do they have other relationships with you, right? Or other products and services that overall is healthy for you as a bank and therefore you, you're going to offer them the service. So, you know, I would say, I would say that's a big challenge, right, for the banks because, you know, everyone says, well, these are the models for API monetization and they go and look at something like Google Maps API where it's the typical tiered model, you know, zero to a thousand calls is free, a thousand to 10,000 is X dollars per month. It's kind of easy because it's just a data commodity that you're purchasing and then you're building it into your, your application. Now, Banks is never that straightforward, right? Because there may be a fee on the product underneath, right? There may be interest income, you know, through the liabilities. So, so, you know, really finding that right mix, that right balance in terms of how you commercialize this and really um, see the value that the other players are, are getting in this value chain. Hey, okay. And then Abhiji, I guess just, just touching on this again, it, it, monetization over kind of uh, more softer benefits. What, what successes have you seen or have you kind of benefited from in, in, in your, your world in terms of pushing this into uh, live production with your business? See, I mean, uh, if you see the metrics of success, right? <clears throat> and open banking in India is a bit new. I mean, hardly four or five years, right? So, the trend and the reports are saying that the number of customer acquisition has increased, right? Uh, retention, customer retention has also increased, right? But at the same time, uh, monetization is also a challenge. We cannot you know, shy away from this fact because here you are doing the collaboration mostly with the startups, right? When any early stage uh, startups come to you, right? And he's asking for some collaborations with you. I mean, to encourage that entire startup ecosystem, you cannot deny him any of the service, right? In most of the cases, we support them. But that GTM, the go-to market, in case of early stage uh, startup, what I have personally seen, uh, probably uh, maybe the other experts will defer, but what I have personally seen, there is little delay from their end, right? And more the GTM is delayed, my monetization part is also getting impacted, right? That's the trend which I've seen in last two or three years. But... Um, uh, the uh, good side is that in last six, seven months, uh, all the new startups about fintechs coming up, right? Uh, they're very really agile in their uh, working methodology, right? They are also looking for a agile method. They are not going for the waterfall. Uh, they also need a quick GTM. And that's how the market is also changing, right? So numbers are there. We are almost there to reach the mark number, right? But yes, monetization is the biggest challenge. And also one part since in India that... You know, it's a, a population of 1.4 billion, right? And there are a huge number of banked customers. And with this, you know, startup ecosystem or collaboration, we are trying to uh, tap the unbanked uh, demography to convert them into banked demography, right? So their security is also a concern, right? Here in rural areas, right, where uh, we are co-building the experiences, there we have seen uh, some... Uh, concerns where uh, security or mostly on that API gateway where we are building all these you know, gateway uh, APIs and we are building all the certificates, right? Few uh, few of the uh, vulnerability we have seen, not vulnerability, few of the concerns we have seen, right? We need to address it. And it's a uh, ever going process. We'll have to uh, evolve around it, right? It's an ongoing process. So these two are the main challenges and uh, positive side which I have seen. Got it. Got it. And I guess kind of wrapping wrapping everything I'm hearing, it, it sounds like, okay, there, there are a number of enablers that, that we, we need to kind of position appropriately. Now, Jashank, if I come to you, and do you, do you feel you have everything you need um, from a, both an internal but also an external viewpoint to, to make kind of how, how DBS is going to kind of play in the open banking ecosystem a success? I think... Uh... There are two um, mindset shifts that is needed, which actually DBS is already aligned. One is that we have to look at building a global product because once you have opened your open APIs to the external world, uh, fintechs who are going to be your partners, then the volumes can increase like 10x. 
so when you have when you are building the platform basically you have to build it from the mindset of that you are building the next google or facebook so in terms of right technologies for the cloud for the cloud cloud computing right technologies for the digital uh, ux and all those things you have to do it from the day one not evolving thing because it's very hard to break down and start from the scratch again once we have put in the platform so uh, so this is the mindset shift for the banks which have they have already started working on and it will keep on evolving to build out these platforms uh, for a global scale second is on the the startups or the fintechs which come across as a partner they should share the equal responsibility and understand that they are also responsible for putting in all the security features and the uh, uh, and the onboarding process so that they don't accidentally uh, 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 destroy the trust that has been built by the banks over the time so so there's a mutual trust which should be respected by both entities and it should not be uh, just a hunger for getting more um, uh, users and making it more um, uh, uh, making more money in the process of destroying the security and the regulatory aspects for the product i got to hear you okay and in terms of kind of that um that target state that that north star vision of of kind of an open data society to enable all of this to happen mark do you, do you think we are anywhere close to getting there within financial services um because we often you see it quite a lot in, in other industries but financial services maybe are less so because data is obviously uh, tied back to a lot of the the value you as a as a banker and institution do bring your customers Yeah, look, I don't think we're anywhere close um, <laughs> to, to answer it quite abruptly. Um, I mean, there's pockets of things happening, right? Such as what HKMA is doing with the data sharing initiative. Um, it, it, it's got to be customer led, right? Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of complex issues around data ownership, um, data privacy, data sharing. Um, you know, there's, there, 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 there are complex risk and compliance issues that need to be navigated. Now, if it's consent-led and if it's customer-led and if there's something in it for the customer to say, hey, you know, open up my data, I'd like it and I'd like to share it with another party, I think that's where we will see it being driven from, right? Because um, that is leveraging on frameworks which are already in place, um, at least in some regions, in terms of how consent management works and the whole idea um, of what the regulatory frameworks were, were such as PSD2, right? They were designed to say, well, I should have access to my data, right? And if, if I want to give that data to a third party platform because it gives me the value I need, then I should be able to do so, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's very early days. It's a, it's a very complex problem. Um, there is a lot of value in it. Um, particularly when you get into, uh, you know, more complex use cases like trade finance and supply chain. Um, but yeah, we, we're a long way off if you ask me. No, okay, I hear you. And um, I guess seeing as we've got four minutes left, just wrapping up, uh, any final remarks from from uh, anyone on the panel here um, on kind of taking that, that the title again of maximizing open banking, anything that we might not have touched on that you feel is an important part of, of how we might kind of continue that journey? So one part uh, <clears throat> I would like to uh, touch upon is that, see, if you see, I mean, uh, three, four years ago also, right? See, APIs in bank is not a new thing, right? APIs were there for years, right? But productizing your API based on the use cases, right? If you see the uh, trend, or if you see the concept which uh, we have observed, right? Earlier, API used to be a service. We used to say that we are providing you API services. Now we are saying that we are offering you API product, right? So we are productizing our APIs uh, based on the use cases, right? And that definitely need a change in the culture and change in the mindset who are dealing with these APIs, right? So if I have to give a major takeaway uh, from this panel, right? Uh, one is that productize your APIs based on the use cases, right? Don't just build up APIs just to, you know, uh, increase the gallery of your API, you know, develop a portal, right? There should be proper use case. Uh, it should be productized and also change the mindset, right? You will have to give some time in it. I mean, you cannot get the result on a, uh, 
no overnight manner right that needs some time and it's an ever-growing process like what mark was saying that trade finance is the new thing or treasury is the new thing where we can bank on recently you know during this wc right this uh, world cup right we have seen in india there are lots of you know fx transactions happen people are uh, used to carry lots of forex prepaid card in last world cup we haven't seen it this type of thing right so this will be ever growing this will be ever evolving around it right and all based on those use cases we'll have to prioritize our apis right so that's my view on that takeaway part brilliant okay well thank you thank you all uh for this it's, it's been a, a really interesting conversation i hope the audience has enjoyed it um jed i think back to you all right. Thank you, Toby. Thank you to the rest of the panelists as well for that really insightful uh, discussion. Thank you, Abhijit, Mark, Shashank. Uh, I'm sure the audience thanks you for sharing all your uh, expert insights with us today. So yeah, as Toby said, if any of you have, have any questions for any of our esteemed speakers here, you can just reach out to them directly by looking for their names over at the People tab by sending them a private message. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. All right, so that is a wrap for our panel session as well as our open banking track. See you all on our next one.